Thanks, Doug, and thanks to all of our attendees for joining us today. We're going to cover a ton of ground, as usual, in these webinars. If you've been on a Sporties webinar in the past, you know we like to move fast and throw out a lot of information so that hopefully all pilots of all experience levels uh, get that information that helps them out. So we're going to get started here and dive right in. My name is John Zimmerman. As Doug said, I work with Doug here at Sporties Pilot Shop in Batavia, Ohio. Uh, have had the chance to play with a lot of these portable avionics as they've been developed. Doug and I both got to work with Stratus as it was developed. We've flown a lot with Sentry. Uh, we've flown a lot with the Garmin products over the years. So we've seen these avionics develop from the product side, but I'm going to speak to you mostly today as a uh, pilot. I fly a variety of airplanes, helicopters. I love general aviation, and I've had a chance to fly with this equipment for the last 10 years, and I'm going to share that perspective. I'll give you two websites uh, in addition to what Doug said about sporties.com slash webinars and our uh, YouTube channel where you can watch a recording of this. We also do a website called Airfax. Airfax is uh, mostly articles written by readers, but we have a series there called Go or No Go where we help you hone your weather decision-making skills. That's a, a great site to check out. It's free. And then we also do a site called iPad Pilot News. As the name suggests, this is focused on flying with the iPad and electronic flight bags. While it's not all about weather, we do cover ADS-B and SiriusXM receivers. We tell you how to get the most out of ForeFlight, Garmin Pilot, Flight Plan Go. So there's a lot of good tips there as well if you're displaying your data link weather on your iPad. Again, both of these sites are free, so it's just a great resource to check out. There are email newsletters you can sign up for to stay up to date. With that, we're going to dive right in. So here's a quick overview of what we're going to cover today. I'm going to start out with five rules for weather flying that I think can help you make smarter decisions. Then we'll do a quick review of ADS-B versus SiriusXM, compare and contrast the two main ways that we get weather in the cockpit. Then we'll talk about the three key weather hazards you need to avoid and what those are and how you can uh, be safe when the, you're dealing with those and how you can use data link weather to avoid them. And then finally, the fun part, we're going to end with five real world scenarios. These are trips I've flown over the last few years using data link weather. I'll share with you some of my decision making process. Some of them I'm proud of, some of them I'm not. And uh, hopefully there's something you can learn there that puts the theoretical part of this into practical application. I think it's important to start out by asking why this matters, because there's so much to learn in aviation, and some of it can seem fairly obscure or not that important. Um, rest assured, I think data link weather is not just a gadget, not just a toy, not just a nice to know. I really believe the smart use of weather technology like ADS-B and SiriusXM really can significantly improve safety. So knowing this stuff, being good at using it, is more than just a nice to know, it can increase safety. And that is hopefully priority number one for all of us. I'm not asking you to take my word for it. So here's a couple of stats to consider. Overall in general aviation over the last 10 years, the accident rate has been fairly steady. It goes up, it goes down. It, there's maybe going down slightly long-term, but when you look at it overall, it's fairly flat. But that overall average masks some interesting trends, one of which you see on the screen here, which is that weather accidents and fatal weather accidents are down pretty steadily and pretty significantly. You see a peak of 62 accidents caused by weather in 2011, and it has, with a, one exception really, I guess most recent year as well, um, with two exceptions, it has been steadily trending down, and we're down over 50%. What happened in 2011? Well, a lot of things, one of which was ADS-B was introduced and receivers like Stratus hit the market. And I, I believe for the first time, tens of thousands of pilots started flying with data link weather for the first time. Now, I'm not drawing a direct relationship between the introduction of ADS-B weather and this accident rate. There's obviously a lot going on, but I do think it's at least interesting and suggestive that maybe this new technology has had an impact on weather accidents. More recently, last year, AOPA had a study commissioned that looked at aircraft flying with ADS-B in. And what they found was there's a 50% lower overall accident rate and a 90% lower fatal accident rate for aircraft flying with ADS-B in. Now, again, th there's this correlation more than causation. Maybe the aircraft that are ADS-B in equipped 
are better maintained. Uh, maybe it's the traffic, not the weather part. Uh, I don't want to go overboard, but I think those two data points together at least suggest that ADSB weather or really data link weather in general can be a very significant enhancement for safety. I mean, a 90% lower fatal accident rate is dramatic. So even if part of that is caused by data link weather, that's cause for celebration. But, and there's always a but, there's always a footnote, with great power comes great responsibility, right? And it's really a self-service world now. So we have access to more weather information than ever before as pilots, and that is great. We have, we have tools that flight service couldn't dream of 30 years ago, but it's really up to us to make these decisions. None of us are walking into a flight service station anymore. Very few of us are even calling and talking to a flight service briefer anymore. You're not talking a flight watch en route. So it's really up to us as pilots to make the right decisions. We have great tools, but it's very much up to us to make those decisions. Let's start with the five weather rules. Hopefully I've convinced you that data link weather can be a safety tool, but hopefully I've also convinced you that it requires some understanding and some knowledge to use it properly. These are five rules I use when flying with data link weather. These are not the FAA's rules or the National Weather Service. These are John's rules. So they're open to debate and interpretation. And they're certainly not the only five rules, but I think they are helpful when organizing your decision-making about weather. And they're good things to fall back on when in doubt. First, always get the big picture first. First things first. I think a lot of pilots skip over this. And uh, I know that I used to skip over this. I had the pleasure of working with Richard Collins, a uh, well-known flying magazine writer and author for decades. And I had the chance to work with him for about 10 years. And this was always one of his preferred things. He said, don't tell me about the METARs. Tell me about the surface analysis. Where are the lows? Where are the fronts? And I always thought that was a little bit academic or not really useful. So I, you know, who cares about the lows? What's the, is the weather above minimums? Uh, of course, he was right because Richard Collins knew more about weather than almost anybody. And the point is, if you start with the big picture, you can create your own personal theory of the weather. You can understand what is really going on in the larger atmosphere. Instead of just reading symptoms, you have a theory for the underlying disease, to use the medical metaphor. We're not just going to go do surgery and cut open a knee. We're going to understand what the problem is with that knee in the first place. So start with that big picture. Look at the surface analysis. Look at where the lows are, where are the fronts, where are they moving, what's driving the weather. It may seem academic, but it really will inform the rest of your decision making. Another one I like to look at a lot is the 500 millibar analysis. This is an upper air chart, shows basically what the winds are doing, typically at about 18,000 feet. Um, this, this can really show you the highways in the sky that drive the weather. You can see here we have a trough over sort of the Great Lakes area in that chart where the air is dipping south and then curving back to the north. Typically, the large weather systems are going to ride those currents. So again, this gives you kind of a, a sense of what's driving the weather, not just is there rain on the radar, but where's it coming from? What's the moisture source? Where's it going to? Where might the instability be? Uh, lows in particular are weather makers. So if you can look at a low on a uh, weather map, if you can look at a low on an upper air analysis chart, you can really get a good sense for what's driving the weather picture. The second rule is to remember the data link delay. Hopefully you have heard this, that all data link weather is delayed. Um, if you haven't, there's a handout in the GoToWebinar software there. You can see under handouts, there's a good informational reminder from the NTSB. Uh, some people make a lot of this that, you know, well, data link weather is delayed, so you can't trust it. That's not how I view it. Data link weather is certainly delayed. Um, sometimes you'll see a timestamp that'll show, as you see here, that the weather is five minutes old, maybe. Remember, that does not include the total latency. So, that five minutes is when your app received the weather. From the time the radar actually swept the sky and transmitted up, you may have another 10 minutes. So you could easily have a 15 minute delayed radar picture you're looking at. You wanna always be conservative with that. Do not assume it is real time weather. Um, as, a, as a related note there, you wanna make that timestamp, which you see circled here in ForeFlight, you wanna make that part of your regular scan en route. Uh, you should be getting regular weather updates. And if you ever see that timestamp get to be 30 minutes old, something's gone wrong 
with your weather receiver, something you need to know about. So almost all apps have this, almost all devices have that. Understand where the timestamp is, check it, learn what it means, but also remember that's not the total delay. Um, there, there's more going on than just the time for your receiver to get it. So remember that delay. Also remember the second part of data link delay. What we've been talking about so far is the delay in transmitting weather. But that ADSB or SiriusXM data link can only transmit the weather information that's updated. And this may be obvious, but some people get tripped up on it. An example would be what you see here in Garmin Pilot. We have a METAR and it says FISB is the source and it says 23 minutes old. Well, how can it be 23 minutes old? I thought METARs are updated every five minutes. Well, the METAR data is sent out every five minutes over that SiriusXM or that ADSB network. But the METAR itself is only updated every hour typically at airports. So just because you're getting quote unquote five minute old data, doesn't mean the METAR is updated every five minutes. So remember that there are both of those delays to keep in mind. Make sure you're getting that data stream regularly, but also remember that the weather data may not be updated every five minutes. So the obvious follow on to that second rule is, how do you use data link weather? Well, you use it for strategic avoidance, not tactical. And maybe you've heard this before, it's uh, cliche to some extent, but it's 100% true. You do not use data link weather to fly up close to weather and pick your way through tightly packed storms. You use it to avoid it by miles and miles and miles. So what I do a lot of times uh, these days with the power of data link weather and a good app, I will look at my route. If there's a cell on the way, I'll tap and grab my course line like you see here and simply drag it out of the way until my route is well clear of the weather. I'll change my flight plan. If I'm IFR, I'll tell ATC I'd like to change my route for weather. And that way, instead of flying up close to the weather and saying, I need 10 degrees right, now I need 15 degrees left, now I need 30 degrees right for five miles, which can be a little bit stressful, go ahead and take the stress out of it and deviate well in advance. Uh, if you're in a jet and you've got onboard radar, that's a different story. You can get up close to it and find a gap. But most of the airplanes we're flying, piston airplanes, you wanna miss this stuff by a long way. So add five minutes to your flight, your passengers will thank you for the smooth ride and make a strategic avoidance many, many miles ahead of time. Number four is go beyond radar. And so far we've been talking a lot about radar. That's the most valuable tool for most pilots. We use it a lot, but it's not the only tool. Radar is a great first look, but don't forget to use all the other tools you get. METARs, pilot reports, cloud tops, lightning, there are new products in the last couple of years from ADSB like cloud tops and turbulence forecasts and lightning. Make sure you know how to get those. Sirius XM, if you fly with that, has even more weather options, which we'll talk about. So don't get hung up purely on radar. Radar by itself is not gonna make a decision for you. Uh, you wanna make sure you're looking at all the details to get a complete picture of the air you're flying through. Number five, and most importantly, the eyes always win. So we talked about real time and what real time weather instruments you have. Well, onboard radar is basically real time, but the best real time weather instrument is the old Mark I eyeball sitting in the left seat. So it's important to consider data link weather as a decision tool. It helps you make a decision. It gives you information. It helps you understand what the weather up ahead of you is doing. However, it does not make a decision for you. Here's a picture on the screen of an ugly looking cloud. Would anybody fly through that cloud even if there was nothing on the data link radar? You know, if, you're, if your screen on ForeFlight had no green or red, would anybody fly through that? I don't think so. That's a nasty looking cloud. So don't overcomplicate it. If it looks ugly out the front window, it probably is ugly. Avoid it. Even IFR, I do a lot of visual deviation. I will try to stay VFR as long as possible and I will avoid it, uh, any cloud that looks ugly. Uh, it's not enough for it to look okay on the radar. Uh, your eyes are still the best weather instrument. So when in doubt, rely on your eyes, not the radar picture. All right, let's do a quick review now of ADSB and SiriusXM. These are the two main ways that we get weather information in the cockpit. Uh, they have uh, some differences and it gets a little confusing, but really overall the similarities uh, are more important. 
let's start with ADSB. ADSB in in rough terms is a network of ground stations. ADSB is run by a system of FAA sponsored ground stations, sort of like cell phone towers spread out all across the United States. So these transmit up, ground up. Think of these like VORs. It's line of sight reception. So you generally need to be in the air to be receiving this. You generally are not gonna get ADSB reception on the ground unless there's an ADSB tower on the field where you are uh, based. However, the reception has gotten quite good as the network has been built out. So here's a map from the FAA of signal coverage at 1500 feet AGL. And you can see that it's really pretty darn good everywhere except uh, out west in the mountainous areas. If you're flying the East Coast, most places you'll have uh, coverage pretty much at pattern altitude. The good news is as you get higher, it gets better. So here is 5,000 feet AGL, and you can see you have at what would be a typical cruising altitude for most GA airplanes. You've got coverage pretty much everywhere. Um, so coverage is definitely something to think about in ADS-B land. If you live in Nevada and you fly low, it's not going to be nearly as good as if you fly on the East Coast. But for most people at cruising altitude, it's going to be pretty good. The other main benefit of ADSB is it's subscription free. Your tax dollars paid for it, so you do not have to uh, pay a monthly subscription for it. You just have to have a receiver that receives ADSB weather and an app or a GPS or something to display it. What weather do you get with ADSB? Pretty much what you'd expect. You get radar, airmets, sigmets, METARs, NOTAMs, pilot reports, TAFs, winds and temps aloft. You can see the update rate there, and it's pretty much in that typical five to 10 minute update rate as we mentioned. Although again, remember that's the transmission interval, not necessarily when the weather product is updated. One other thing to notice there is the radar. There are two radar uh, packages there, CONUS or the entire US and then regional. So We'll get into this a little bit later, but the important thing to remember is that there are two weather products, they are different resolutions, and they are transmitted at different intervals. Um, so if you take off and you get a radar picture within about 250 miles of your airplane, but you're not getting it a uh, thousand miles out, that probably just means you have the regional uh, next rad picture, but not the CONUS one yet. That's not a problem. Just be patient. It'll come in. One other fact to remember when you're talking about ADSB is that there are different types of ADSB ground stations. Uh, ADSB ground stations, again, kind of like VORs, are set up with surface, low altitude, medium altitude, and high altitude. In everyday flying, this is really not something you need to worry about, so don't get bogged down in these details. But it's worth remembering that these different station types do transmit different weather products. So you'll notice, for example, a surface weather station only transmits regional radar. It does not transmit CONUS NEXRAD. So um, again, in typical flying, you're going to have four, five, eight, ten stations. So you'll have some of all types and it really doesn't matter. But if you're in, in an area of marginal coverage and you uh, feel like you're not getting all the weather, take a look and see if maybe you're only getting a surface or a low altitude station. All right, so that's ADSB. It's subscription free and it's ground based. The other option is Sirius XM. This is sort of the opposite. This is satellite based. It's transmitted down from satellites flying overhead. So the advantage of that is it works at all altitudes. There's none of this coverage issue. You don't have to be in the air. You can even get Sirius XM on the ground. Um, it also will offer some coverage in Southern Canada and Northern Caribbean. So you can see the coverage map there. It's pretty much it's an entire US and a good chunk of North America. Uh, so this is great. You don't have to worry about coverage. You don't have to worry about altitude. Um, and you've got a little bit of international coverage. Of course, there's no free lunch. So there is a, a cost for this. You're gonna pay a monthly subscription, typically 30 to $100 a month. That 30 to $40 a month seems to be the most popular. You can see the packages there on screen. Uh, and, and even the $30 a month gets you the basic basics that you want. You're going to have radar, METARs, TAS, lightning, uh, the, the essential things you want. One other thing that a lot of people don't know with SiriusXM is that you can suspend your subscription one time per year for up to six months. So if you're a seasonal flyer, maybe you only fly uh, in the summertime and in the wintertime, it's just not flying weather for your airplane. 
you could activate your subscription and fly with Sirius XM all summer long and avoid those thunderstorms, but you do not have to have it active in the dead of winter when you're not flying. So a good flexible option to keep in mind if you're flying with Sirius XM. One of the other advantages you get with Sirius XM, in addition to that coverage at all altitudes, is that you have more weather products available. So it's not just the ADSB products. You've got two types of comp two types of radar, base and composite, which we'll talk about here in just a second. You also have storm cell tops and movement, and that's what you see on the screen here. These arrows show the speed and direction of movement for those cells and the tops. So 350 there means the tops are at 35,000 feet. 400 means 40,000 feet. So that can help you diagnose a storm and determine whether something is really convective and a thunderstorm and nasty, or if it's just rain. You also get satellite imagery. One of the main things uh, that's lacking on ADSB is satellite imagery. And you do get that, as you see again here on a Garmin pilot screen, you get satellite over Sirius XM. You also get some other tools like the service analysis chart, uh, which is good for that big picture overview. Let's talk real briefly about base and composite reflectivity. This is available in ForeFlight when you're connected to the internet on the ground or with Sirius XM. And some pilots get tripped up by this. Base reflectivity is basically the lowest tilt angle from the radar. So if you picture a next red radar uh, sweeping the sky out uh, in the middle of Kansas, it's going to sweep the sky 360 degrees at various tilt angles. So it'll sweep the sky low, then tilt up and sweep again, then tilt up again and sweep. Base reflectivity is taking that lowest slice of the atmosphere. In really rough terms, you can think of it as sort of maybe what's coming out the bottom of the clouds. And so a lot of times you'll hear, you know, a TV weatherman use this because they want to know, is it raining where I am? Uh, that's helpful, especially if you're flying low level, maybe a VFR under a cloud base. You want to know what's really raining versus what's just a wet cloud. For a lot of pilots, though, I think composite's more useful. Composite is what is transmitted over ADSB because composite reflectivity gives you the worst case. It'll scan the sky, all those tilt angles, and it will show the, the worst or the highest reflectivity from all those scan angles. So you can see the difference here on screen. We have base on the top, and it's really mostly green and yellow. You have composite on the bottom, and there's a lot more yellow and some orange. Composite tends to overstate the reflectivity, but again, that's a good thing because we fly in three dimensions. We're not just driving a car down the road. We care about all three dimensions of that weather, so we kind of want to know the worst case scenario. So when in doubt, fly with composite reflectivity. It is the worst case, it is the conservative approach, it's probably what you're used to seeing, uh, and that's probably what you want to use most of the time. The only time to me that base can come into play is an example here. Uh, you can see we've got the radar on, composite on the left, and there's a whole bunch of green returns over Southern Ohio and Northern West Virginia there. But if you skip over to the right on the METAR, it says, huh, look at that at Parkersburg, it's good VFR, you know, sky clear below 12,000, 10 miles, light winds. I mean, we'd fly in that weather in any, I'd get fly in a Cub in that. Well, you can solve the problem by turning on base. You can see that base reflectivity eliminates a whole lot of that light green returns to the north. There's still definitely some rain in Kentucky and West Virginia further to the south there. Uh, that's the heart of it. But that northern part may just be high altitude, kind of a blow off off the top of that rain. It may just be moist clouds. It's definitely not reaching the ground. It's definitely not impacting visibility or ceiling. So that's an example where, especially if you're flying VFR, comparing composite and base can kind of help tease out exactly what the rain might be doing. But again, as a general rule, when in doubt, I suggest flying with composite. Here's a helpful side-by-side -side comparison uh, on ADS-B versus Sirius XM if you're comparing the two. Again, the basic uh, weather data is the same with both of them, METARs, TAFs, radar, PIREPs, but there are differences in terms of how it's transmitted. So you'll notice that typically METARs, for example, on ADSB, you'll have every airport within about 500 miles of you, but beyond 500 miles, you'll only have those larger airports. You will not have a small county airport a thousand miles away, at least not until you get closer to it. Sirius XM, on the other hand, transmits nationwide. So you have all the METARs in the U.S. in one shot. 
Uh, and then you can see a couple of the differences in products, no satellite image with ADS-B, uh, but no NOTAMs with Sirius XM, which you do get uh, on ADS-B. The biggest thing that comes up when we compare and contrast ADS-B and Sirius XM is typically radar. And you may have heard Sirius XM radar is higher resolution, ADS-B radar is blocky. That's sort of true, but not totally. Uh, let's explore this a little bit. Here's an example from ForeFlight of ADS-B radar on the left, Sirius XM on the right. They're really the same basic resolution. Uh, some apps, especially over the internet, uh, will do lots of smoothing to make a radar picture look good. So it'll take that blocky display and it'll run all kinds of uh, algorithms through it to smooth it out and contour it and make it look much better. At the end of the day, the raw data supporting that radar picture is fairly blocky. Um, so in general, the res resolution is the same. However, Sirius XM has that same resolution nationwide. So you can see here we are, we've just taken off from Denver, we're headed back to Ohio. We have uh, rain that's well over 500 miles away. And on Sirius XM, it's showing up full resolution. There's no degradation as you get further away. On the other hand, ADS-B has two different resolutions. So ADS-B, you can see closer to the airplane is pretty high res, it basically looks the same as Sirius XM. But notice down towards the southeast near uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, it gets pretty blocky. That is that CONUS picture. That's that national ADS-B picture that's only transmitted every 15 minutes, and it's not as high a resolution. It's certainly good enough for long-term planning. We know there's some ugly storms probably down there. And as we get closer, it will get higher resolution. But you can definitely tell a difference between that regional, serious, regional ADS-B radar picture and the national ADS-B picture. So if you've heard about blocky ADS-B radar or the differences, that's really the way to think about it. The regional picture close to you is going to be plenty high resolution to make any decisions you need to make. It's that national picture that can look a little blocky. One other thing to remember is you will only have radar where there is ground-based radar that works. So again, you have to have that data link connection, whether it's ADS-B or SiriusXM to get data, but you also have to have the data to travel over the data link. And there are some parts out west that do not have uninterrupted NextRed radar coverage. So you can see southeastern Oregon, northern Nevada, there's a little gap there. So even if you have perfect reception of ADS-B or perfect reception of SiriusXM, you are not gonna have ground-based radar to look at simply because there's no radar site out there that can paint it. All right, with that understanding of sort of what drives Sirius XM and ADS-B, now let's look at the hardware. How do I actually put this to use? I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because there are lots of good options and almost all of them are good, so there's really no point uh, in belaboring it. Uh, it's mostly a matter of fitting the right option to the type of flying you do. I would start with the app. If you fly with Garmin and you love it, I would stick with Garmin. If you fly with ForeFlight or FlyQ or FlightPlan or whatever you use, stick with the app and then pick a receiver that works with your app. Uh, I would not let the hardware necessarily drive the app decision. All of these do the same basic thing in terms of GPS and weather and traffic. So think about the extras if you're between two devices. Think about flight data recording or carbon monoxide detector. Think about whether those extra features are helpful to you or not. I do think battery life is another thing to think about. Some of these have uh, no battery. Some of these have very long batteries built in. If you're a renter and you don't want to worry about wires, to me, long battery life is a great thing. Uh, if you own an airplane and maybe you have a panel-mounted uh, USB charger, you may not care about a battery. You're just going to plug it in. And then finally, think about ease of use and support. Think about the company behind it and what you hear out there from other pilots about what's reliable and what's easy to use. If you're thinking ADS-B, here are the four main options that uh, we see most often. Stratus 3 from Apario, uh, the third generation of a, a very popular device, has a good reputation, has the basics uh, that you expect, weather, traffic, GPS, AHARs to provide that backup attitude information. It also has FDR, flight data recorder, so it will record your flight as you fly, including that AHARs data for pitch and bank and allow you to play that back. So a nice all-in-one unit has an eight-hour battery built in, and it works with a variety of apps, ForeFlight, FlightPlan Go, WingX, iFly, and FlyQ. If you're looking for a good value, Century Mini is a great choice. It's only 299 
It works with the Four Flight app, uh, and it doesn't have a battery. So you will need to plug this in either through a cigarette lighter or a battery pack. But as a result, it's very small, uh, and it has GPS, and it has weather and traffic. So no AHARs, no battery. But if you're looking for just a good uh, weather receiver and you don't need all the bells and whistles, that would be my recommendation. It's nice and small and, and affordable. If you want to step up, Century Mini's big brother, the uh, full-size Sentry adds that battery, so it's got a 12-hour battery life, it can go all day, totally wireless. And it also adds a carbon monoxide detector, uh, which is a nice thing to have in the wintertime. Most of our heating systems are uh, used by exhaust-warmed shrouds, and a leak there can cause carbon monoxide poisoning. So having an extra set of eyes and ears on board there to monitor carbon monoxide can be a good thing. It will alert both in the app and the device itself with a very loud alarm. And it's $4.99, and both of those centuries, centuries work with four flight only, uh, but are good devices and uh, very reliable. I've flown with both of them a lot. Another good option is Garmin GDL50. This works with Garmin Pilot, Four Flight, and Flight Plan Go. It also works with Garmin portable GPSs. So if you have uh, something like a Garmin Era 660, you could display weather on both an iPad and a portable GPS, which is a unique feature. If you're looking for Sirius XM, there's really only one uh, standalone option. That's the GDL51 from Garmin. It's 649. Again, works with Garmin Pilot, Four Flight, Flight Plan Go, and Garmin GPSs. This is Sirius XM weather and GPS and AHARs to drive that backup attitude and synthetic vision. It has a built-in eight-hour battery, so it's totally wireless. Uh, just turn it on, put it on the dash. It'll connect to your device by Bluetooth, so there's no... No wires in the cockpit. And right now, through the end of the year, there's a $200 rebate from SiriusXM. So the price gets down pretty reasonable where you're going to pay a monthly subscription, but the price of the hardware is pretty affordable. The ultimate option would be the all-in-one GDL52 from Garmin. It's $1149. This is SiriusXM weather and radio. It also has ADS-B, so a nice tool there. You can use SiriusXM for the weather and ADS-B for the traffic. It also has a GPS built in and AHARs, five hour battery. So this is a great kind of no compromise. If you want to use uh, the, the very best weather with Sirius XM, but have the option to use ADS-B weather if you want, or use that ADS-B traffic and have synthetic vision and really have everything built in and it works with multiple apps. This is a great, great unit. You do pay for it, but there is also that $200 rebate on this unit. So it gets it down under $1,000. And SiriusXM is also offering a three-month free trial right now, uh, with which you get three months of SiriusXM aviation weather and radio. Lots to compare there. You'll notice in the handout section, I've included this chart of a comparison of Datalink weather receivers. So if you're interested in really doing a line-by-line -line comparison between products, here are some of the most popular options out there and the key features. You can see that all of them have GPS and weather, which is really the essential. It's a matter of whether you want ADS-B or Sirius XM, whether you want that AHARS to drive backup attitude, whether you want battery and pricing. So download that from the handout section if you'd like to compare and help make the best choice. All right, we're gonna talk about the three key weather hazards and then we'll talk about some of those scenarios to put this into play. And the three key hazards are IFR conditions, thunderstorms and icing. I say that because if you look at the accident statistics, and these are from the AOPA Air Safety Institute, you can see that the vast majority of weather accidents are caused by these conditions. VFR and IMC is still a huge cause of weather accidents. Uh, poor IFR technique can kind of be considered somewhat the same thing for IFR pilots. Um, and then thunderstorms and icing. If you can eliminate these threats, you eliminate almost 80% of weather accidents. So I think it's worth focusing on these three. When we talk about IFR conditions, most of us will immediately go to METARs. What's the METAR and is it above VFR minimums or is it above my personal minimums? That's a great place to start, but that's not where you stop. Uh, it's not just a matter of reading site METARs and making up your mind. I like to turn on a visual map of METARs. All of these apps let you do that, turn on a map layer that shows the METARs. Sometimes it'll just be the colored circles. Sometimes you can turn on the ceiling or the visibility. As simple as that sounds, I think it makes a big difference because you get a big picture view at a glance of what are the weather conditions. Is it just an isolated IFR? Maybe it's valley fog by the river, 
or is it really widespread IFR conditions or marginal VFR conditions? Having that big picture view can help you plan a route and plan an out. So make sure you go beyond just reading the text and make that METAR map visual. I also like to use satellite imagery. On the ground ahead of time, turn it on. If you're in flight and you have Sirius XM, turn it on. This can really give you, again, that visual sense of where are the clouds, how thick are the clouds in certain parts. It can help inform you beyond just a METAR. Again, a METAR is great, but it tells you at that exact airport what's going on. It doesn't tell you beyond that. And that's where satellite image can help fill in the gap. Pilot reports are also very helpful. Uh, that's a real-time weather sensor. If you have another pilot out there who's reported the tops or the bases or the visibility, check for those pilot reports. And then that surface analysis. Again, the big picture is what we're after here, not just a site METAR, but that big picture. Where are the lows and the fronts? What is causing any marginal VFR conditions? What can I expect the trend to do? If there's a warm front moving in, I'm probably not going to expect conditions to get better. They're probably going to get worse. So knowing that big picture, knowing the overview can help you decide whether you want to be skeptical or optimistic about the forecast. Of course, once you've got that big picture, once you've looked at the maps, you do want to read METARs. There's nothing better than understanding what's happening at the airport you're flying to. And the, and the text here can matter. You know, all these apps do a nice job of translating, which is helpful. So it's good to not have to read the code all the time. Uh, but you do want to be fluent in METARs, not just uh, read the decoded only. Here's an example. We have uh, out in ski country in Colorado, 700 feet overcast, half a mile visibility, light snow. Well, that is um, low IFR. Uh, at some airports, 700 and a half would be above minimums, so uh, you might fly that, but you want to go beyond that. Here's, an ex here's another example. Uh, we've got three miles visibility, light snow, broken 600, overcast 1100. Well, that is above minimums at that airport. We've got an ILS there that goes to 200 and a half, so you might look at that and say, huh, well, it's an IFR day. We're definitely going to have to shoot an approach, but not too bad. But look at that whole second line and all the code there that many of us will skip over. There's some pretty important stuff hidden in there. For example, that FZDZ tells you that freezing drizzle just ended a minute ago. Uh, no ice accumulation in the last hour, but you did get 0.14 inches of ice in the last six hours. So what that tells you is while the weather may be above IFR approach minimums, there's a whole lot more going on there and you may have ice on the runway. So go beyond just the decoded METAR and read all those comments, especially if the weather is marginal. You don't have to have this memorized. You can Google a lot of this and get translations for what these mean. You can print out online cheat sheets. Uh, nobody's probably going to remember every last one of these. But make it a habit to, to read beyond just the headlines there and understand what's going on at a deeper level. One other thing to point out for VFR pilots, if you're trying to avoid IFR, rain is not your friend. And again, that may sound obvious that, you know, well, rain can cut visibilities, but rain can also cut visibility long after it's left. Uh, particularly if it's been persistent showery rain, that can cause low level scud to form, that can cause mist to form if there are hills or mountains. So light scattered showers that uh, sort of go off and on for hours, can leave behind uh, marginal VFR or IFR conditions hours after the radar clears. So if you're trying to fly around the backside of some rain, keep in mind that just because the radar is cleared out and just because the, the green and the yellow is gone may not mean the marginal VFR conditions are gone. All right, so that's the IFR conditions that we're trying to avoid. Second threat was thunderstorms. This is the obvious one that everybody talks about with data link weather, and it is important. Here's a classic example. We are flying south out of Cincinnati, and here's our radar picture. A lot of green, but some yellow, and even a little bit of orange. What the question comes up is, obviously, would you fly through that? Are we going to fly through that or deviate? And my argument to you would be, you don't know based on that picture alone. Yeah, there's some orange, so if you just wanted to always avoid orange, that would be safe, and there's nothing wrong with that. But remember what radar tells you. Radar by itself just tells you it's reflecting water. So all that orange tells you is it's reflecting some more moderate rain. You really don't know if it's convective or not, and that's the key question. What we really want to know is not so much how hard is it raining, but is it convective? Is this a building thunderstorm? Are we going to get tossed around in there? 
And to answer that question, you need to look at more than just the color of the radar. I like to remember it with the acronym SIGH, S-I-G-H. Look at four parts when you're evaluating a radar signature. Look at the shape. Are there any hooks? Are there any ugly looking parts to it? Um, you know, a blob versus a sharply defined line. Uh, the shape does matter. You've probably all seen meteorologists on TV looking at, you know, echoes for tornadoes and everything. You don't have to get that detailed, but we all know there are certain shapes that are just uglier and more convective than others. The second one is intensity, and that's the color. That's what we all look at. Purple is bad, green is good. It's more it's more complicated than that, but certainly that is part of the story, is the, is the color. Gradient is almost as important, though. Look at these two pictures on screen. The left one shows a fast-moving squall line. It goes from nothing to green to yellow to red in the span of a mile or two. It's almost directly to red. That's a very steep gradient. That, to me, tells me some severe weather. That is something you don't want to fly through in anything. Versus look at the picture on the right. It's a much more shallow gradient. It's green and then it's darker green and then it's yellow. Uh, that is most likely just rain. And in fact, on this flight it was. There's nothing but rain in there. You can tell because there's really no purple or red. It's a shallower gradient. There's no ugly looking shapes there. That can really help answer that question about convection. The last one is height, and if you fly with Sirius XM or if you're on the ground beforehand, this can be helpful because you can look at the echo tops. An echo top of 20,000 feet is not likely to be severe weather. An echo top of 40 or 50,000 feet is very likely to be severe weather. So none of these things on their own necessarily answers the question, but you put them all together and you have a much better sense of what you're looking at. Am I looking at rain? Am I looking at thunderstorms? If you run through those four things real quick, you'll get a lot closer to the truth. Now, when we talk about the intensity, when we talk about radar colors, it is important to remember what you're looking at. This is taken from ForeFlight, and you can see on the left, internet, meaning we're connected to Wi-Fi on the ground, looking at radar. We have all these different shades of green. ADS-B, we have fewer, and SiriusXM, we have fewer, but we have more than ADS-B. The point here is not to memorize the exact decibels for each one of these, but just notice that you could have a 35 dBZ cell that would show up as yellow on Sirius XM, but would still be green on ADS-B. So the colors, while they're more or less aligned, they are not identical. One of the things you can do if you want to check this is go into ForeFlight and turn on four color radar. If you go to the maps page and tap that settings gear at the top, you can turn this on, and this is sort of a spot check to see um, how things compare. Here's an example in flight. We've got four color radar on the left. We've got the traditional on the right. Typically, the four color radar overstates things. So you can see in this example, we've got a lot of red to the south, where in the regular ADS-B radar, it's really mostly just yellow and a tiny bit of orange. So four color most of the time will be more conservative. But again, that's no bad thing. And if you're ever unsure, uh, this is a good thing to try. This is kind of personal preference. To me, four color radar doesn't give quite the nuance of the main one, so I don't fly with it all the time. But if you're unsure or you're really trying to diagnose uh, a system you're, you're coming up on, four color radar can be helpful for kind of, kind of giving you a sanity check. So beyond just looking at the radar, use those other tools when we avoid thunderstorms. Lightning, pyreps, metars, cloud tops. Again, don't just look at the color. If there's lightning, that's obviously a great indication there's a thunderstorm. If there's a pilot report of moderate or severe turbulence, that's also valuable. Um, so again, it, it may sound obvious, but a lot of people I find look at radar and, and say, well, that's a thunderstorm or it's not. You have so many tools now that you can go just beyond that and consider the entire radar picture and consider those other tools to really make an accurate diagnosis. I also like the ruler tool in a lot of these apps. That can help you kind of estimate how far you are from weather, how big a gap there may be between lines. Um, this is very helpful, but don't get carried away. Uh, here's an example where I would not try to shoot this gap based on just my ruler tool. This is something you want to absolutely do visually. So I like to use the ruler as a rough guide and certainly give you a clue about what might be possible, but this is not the deciding factor. All right, the final one we're gonna talk about is icing. And like all weather decisions, we start with the big picture. With icing, the big, big picture is where are you flying? Uh, 
Uh, notice here, this is the percentage of the time with icing conditions, according to NASA, between November and March. Not a surprise if you're in Southern California, the probability of icing, no matter what the weather, is much lower than the Pacific Northwest. So start with that knowledge of just where you are geographically. Then think about what you're flying in. Is this dry clouds, wet clouds? Uh, where's Again, where's the low? Typically east of a low, north and east of a low is the worst icing in a major weather system. So you wanna be cognizant of that. Uh, understand if there's an inversion. An inversion, a temperature inversion can cause freezing rain, which is the worst kind of ice. So before we even look at the weather data, uh, again, start with that big picture overview. There are better icing forecasts now than ever before, uh, both pre-flight and in-flight. These are models, computer models, but they've gotten very, very good. So in four-flight, you'll notice an icing US and an icing global map layer. The US one is the short range model, goes to 18 hours. It's updated every hour, which is nice, and it's higher resolution. The uh, GFS one is, is only updated four times a day and it's lower resolution but it does go out to 24 hours and it is global. So typically in the US, you're gonna use the, the uh, uh, icing US one. And what you're looking at here really is the severity of, you know, the, the light blue is probably light ice, the darker blue is maybe light to moderate, the really dark blue is moderate. So you're looking at what is the severity of ice. You have a similar tool in flight uh, on ADS-B and Sirius XM. What you get is every 2,000 feet, from 2,000 feet to 24,000 feet, the probability of icing. Uh, that's what you're looking at with ADS-B, is what is the likelihood, not the severity, but the likelihood of icing. So this can be helpful. Again, this is a model, this is a forecast tool, this is not a real-time observation, but if you're trying to make a plan to avoid ice, this is helpful. It's also helpful to use the cloud tops tool, because many times getting out of ice means finding the top. So if there's icing, but you can be on top by 8,000 feet, you may have a pretty solid out. This is available again, ADS-B and Sirius XM. Uh, on ADS-B, this is a forecast, not an observation. And it's also worth pointing out, this is really to get a general idea of where are the tops higher and lower. This is not a precise tool to tell you if 10,000 or 10,500 feet will be on top. You can see here in four flight, there's the slider bar on the right side of the screen. That's where you can pick the altitude. And where you see blue on the screen there, that means there will be uh, clouds at that altitude or above. Where the map is clear, you should be on top at that altitude. So use this as a rough guide. Where can I get on top or at least where are the clouds tops higher or lower? But don't assume the resolution here is hundreds of feet. It's just not that accurate. Of course, the other great tool to use beyond a forecast for icing is pilot reports. Pilot reports are great for icing, uh, probably the most important real-time tool in flight we can use. These are transmitted on ADS-B and Sirius XM. Just remember that not all pi reps are created equal. Uh, you want to think about the airplane type because moderate icing to a Cessna 172, it might be light icing on a 767. Uh, climb or descent matters. Again, take that 767. If it's descending uh, up at the red line of its airspeed, it's going so fast, simply the friction of the air moving across the skin of that wing is going to heat it up. So moderate ice from a heavy jet in a descent is serious stuff. Moderate ice from a 172 in a climb may not be a big deal in a turbine airplane. But beyond that, go beyond just the light and moderate, look for the detail. You can see the one on screen here that shows in the remarks section, this is pretty bad ice you're dealing with here, regardless of what you're flying. So go beyond just that light or moderate, read the details and see what you can learn. The other thing to keep in mind is that a lack of icing pie reps does not mean a lack of icing. It could be that the icing is so bad that nobody's flying. So don't automatically assume that no pilot reports equals no ice. The only other thing I'll add here is if you're flying, give pi reps. Even if there's nothing to report, a report of negative ice is sometimes the most valuable pilot report you can give. So uh, ATC, the FAA, AOPA, everybody's been on us to give more pilot reports and I would back that up. Give pilot reports whenever you can. All right, I'm gonna close with five real world scenarios here that put this into practice and hopefully make some of this uh, make a little bit more sense. These are trips I have flown and I'll share with you my thought process. Here's one, this was a long trip. We were headed out west 
and the radar image was not pretty. There were multiple lines of what looked like convective weather here, just did not look pretty at all. And I woke up and I looked at the radar picture and I thought, well, we're not going. But then I got to thinking, I thought, well, who cares what the weather is in Missouri? Our goal is to get from Ohio to Las Vegas. So our only goal is to get from Ohio to Las Vegas. Who cares how we get there? So we took off and we simply took what Mother Nature gave us. We went well north of our direct route, well north, uh, into Minnesota even. And yes, this added some time, but I fly for fun. So an extra hour in the airplane is most of the time fun. We actually stayed VFR or VMC conditions here most of the way and had a nice ride, hardly had a bounce. So it sounds obvious here, but don't get locked into direct from your departure to your destination. The lesson is to go around the weather. Uh, some, some might have tried to pick through uh, those cells and go more or less direct and see where the soft spot is, quote unquote. I think a much better way to do it is use that data link weather to just go all the way around it. Take the sure thing and miss the entire cell. Uh, acknowledge that's going to add some time. But in my experience, it's always less time than you think. You feel like you're going to take this detour and it's going to double your time en route, and it never does. Sometimes you're talking about adding 10 minutes to a two and a half hour flight. And I can assure you, if that gives you a smoother ride, your passengers at the very least will appreciate it. So my lesson there was, uh, remember the mission. The mission here was to get to your destination. Your mission was not to fly a direct route. Take what Mother Nature gives you. Second one, this is a different day. It's not as organized. This is your kind of typical Southeast pop-up thunderstorm day. This was summertime over South Carolina, North Carolina, Kentucky. Nothing really organized, but lots of storms around. And this is gonna be a late afternoon flight. I call this popcorn flying. All the white puffies are popping. This is a little different story. This one, we did IFR, but honestly would have been just as easy VFR because the only rule here is stay visual and miss all of the bumpy clouds. Who cares if they're on radar? You want to miss all of those billowing clouds. So data link here is more in a supporting role. Data link lets you know what's 50 or 100 miles down the road. Data link weather also tells you where your guaranteed out is. It can basically help you from stumbling into a trap. But at the end of the day, we navigated like this. You get up above the haze layer where the visibility is good, and you simply bob and weave around all those buildups. That picture there shows some some white puffies that I guarantee were not on the radar, but we're not going to fly through them. You wouldn't, the airplane wouldn't be torn apart there, but you'd get jostled around pretty good, so why even mess with it? We simply asked ATC for a series of deviations and just started weaving through all those, stayed VFR the entire way, and had a flying flight home. You can see we zigzagged all across the sky, um, but as long as you stay visual and as long as you use that data link weather to give you an out, so you always know where you have a safe place to go if things start to go wrong, this is actually a pretty easy trip. You just, like, once again, take what Mother Nature gives you. The lesson there again, fly the trip as sort of a series of short cross countries. If you're dealing with convective weather, and that's that critical question, the second thing to determine is, how long can we stay visual and just fly from airport to airport if you have to? Uh, staying visual, keeping that out safe, and avoid all the clouds. All right, this is a different one. This was an IFR flight in the winter. Not the most pretty weather map of all time. Uh, rain everywhere, pilot reports. The real concern here is icing. I was flying IFR here, so I really didn't wasn't too worried about the IFR or even the rain because this was just rain. Again, look, it's green. There's no sharp gradient. There's no lightning. So uh, I, I knew from the big picture that this was just rain. There was nothing convective. But it was also December, and so I knew icing was a concern. The answer here is to use it all. Use the satellite. Here's the icing forecast. Use the pilot reports. And as ugly as it looked, especially up high, lots of icing pie reps in the high teens and 20s. But look here, you can see the map in foreflight shows that down below about 12,000 or 10,000 feet, we've got an ice-free ride until we get almost to our destination. So don't just focus on the radar here. Look at those other tools, back it up with pie reps, and use METARs here to know where's your out? Where do I know I have high ceilings or above freezing on the ground so I've got a solid gold alternate I can go to if I do start picking up ice? Uh, at the end of the day here, I went and really had a pretty pretty nice ride. Uh, ice-free forecast and ice-free pie reps below 12,000 feet, so I knew that I had uh, many thousands of feet of cruising altitude there that appeared to be ice-free. 
lots of rain again, but it was mostly green, no lightning, no gradient. So I knew it was most likely rain. And I had high ceilings in route, so I had a great alternate. Here's my destination, where as ugly as the radar looked, you can see there's 9,500 feet overcast and 10 miles of visibility. So this was just rain falling from high clouds. So it's a reminder to me that as ugly as it looked on the radar, this was not a bad day to fly. If you use all the information, go beyond that ugly radar picture to take in all the facts, you can find a path. Uh, and we did find a path that day. Scenario four here, this is a VFR trip, low level. This was actually in a helicopter, so IFR is not an option. We were going to be going at 1,000 to 2,500 feet AGL no matter what. Um, and I, I pulled up the, the chart in four flight, and it didn't look too bad. A couple tiny green rain showers, but you can see 3,600 feet was the lowest ceiling, uh, 6,500 feet up here. Looks like a pretty decent VFR day, maybe a little rain shower to weave around, but uh, all in all, not bad at all. So off we went, and this is what we found. I had ignored my rule of starting with the big picture, and I just looked at the radar on the METAR because I was in a hurry, and I blasted off. What I didn't think about was the larger weather system, the temperature and dew point, and the terrain. That rain wasn't too heavy, but it had kicked up a lot of scud and mist because there were hills and mountains. So I had interpolated between these METAR sites that were 50 miles apart. I said, well, it's VFR here, and it's VFR there. It must be VFR in between. Classic mistake, because in between was, was clouds and mountains that had created their own weather. So it's a reminder that METARs only give you a spot weather report. And you really want to go beyond that to get that bigger picture of what's in store. Now, I was saved here because I did follow another one of my rules, which was always have a solid out. And I had a solid out that the terrain to the west was much lower with a highway. And I simply diverted 90 degrees to the west got away from all of the scud and had a fine flight. But I kicked myself because I really hadn't gone beyond the METARs and radar picture. So that was my lesson learned. Uh, always have an out, but more importantly, really understand the entire route of flight. And if there aren't METARs, try to fill in the gap in information with other weather products. All right, here's the last one. We're coming home from the west, trying to get to Cincinnati. You can see there is an ugly, ugly line of storms. It's purple, it's a sharp gradient. Uh, you can tell right away that this is a nasty, nasty line of weather. There's no way we're going through that in anything. But it looks like there was a nice break to the north. Looks like we can make it around the north side, no problem. We got closer and things were starting to fill in a little bit, but it looked like there's still really a pretty good gap there. So we thought we still might make it because there's a hole, right? Well, there's your hole. And this is one of my favorite weather pictures because it's proof that the eyes always win. You can see the hole. You can see blue through there. Uh, but I'm not going to try it because it sure looks like sort of the anvil blowing off the top of a thunderstorm. There could be hail, turbulence, Lord knows what. No way was I going to fly through that gap. So this was a day for the eyes. Even though the, the data link radar seemed to paint a pretty clear picture of a hole, there was no hole that I wanted to fly through. So once again, the lesson, your eyes always get a veto. No matter what the, the radar picture or the METARs or the PIREPs say, when in doubt, fall back on the eyes, and that's what we did. So in wrapping up here, a reminder about those five ways to make smarter decisions. Know the big picture. Remember that data link weather is delayed. Use it for strategic, not tactical avoidance. Go beyond that radar to use all the tools. And when in doubt, trust your eyes. Avoid the ugly clouds out there. The way I think about it is sort of like a flow. You start big picture with that knowledge and you get an overview. Then you go to data link for a little bit more specific, a little bit more up-to-date information. But the bottom of that funnel is your eyes. The bottom of the funnel is what you see from the cockpit. And that's where it all flows to. You are the pilot in command. So it's up to you to make that decision. Data link weather gets a vote, but it does not make the decision for you. And I'll close with this quote because I love it from Richard Collins. He said, nobody gets trapped by weather. There are always signs. And when I first read that, I thought, there's no way that's true. Sometimes people just get trapped. But the more and more I fly and the more I study weather, uh, I'm pretty well convinced that Richard Collins was right. There are signs. You just have to know where to look and you have to want to find out. So uh, remember, there are signs. Just be looking for them.